Thank you, thank you. Ooh. <laughs> well, will you look at that? Craig, stand up. Give give the Lord a big hand clap for that guy right there. Amen. We talk about this guy about every week. And here he is back with us today, and uh, so you be sure and grab a hold of him and hug his neck. Amen. Amen. All right, let's get sanctified again, dignified and all that other kind of fied. Listen, there have been some real good things happening here in church lately, and uh, Wednesday night and Sunday nights and, and even Sunday mornings, there have been some fantastic things happening but at the same time when good things happen it it the enemy raises his head hello uh bob and janice have been fighting janice's heartbeat and her heart rhythm and all that has been uh up and down and and messed up and and uh, so we need to continue to pray for her and then bob was walking around his place the other day and and is probably blew a tendon out of his knee, and so he is uh, going in on Thursday uh, for more, uh, probably some, some, an MRI or, or something like that uh, to see what's going on with his knees, but he's down, she's down, uh, the enemy is, is trying to come against anybody that he can come against, amen, he's, he, he's doing everything that he can to uh, raise, raise hate and discontent. And uh, I just want to share a little bit this morning about what he's up against. Amen? I want to I talk about the Trinity this morning. I want to talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in this place today. Uh, the Trinity is one of the great theological mysteries of the church and and people have tried to explain it uh, from day one and and have had nothing but trouble doing it I'm not trying to explain it I'm just gonna declare it how about that because I don't think it needs to be necessarily explained we just need to understand that it's in God's Word God said it I believe it and that settles it and and it's it's our it's our choice to believe or not believe the word of God. Now, Lord, this morning I need your help to declare your word. I need your help to rightly divide the word of truth, Father. I need your your help. I need your anointing. I need you to take the coal from the altar and and anoint these lips of clay today. That God, that you would be glorified. That you would be exalted. That you would be lifted up, Father God. That the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost would be glorified and be honored in this house today. Lord, that we would walk out of this place today knowing that we've been in the presence of the Most High God. And for that, I thank you and give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Stand with me real quick this morning and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Second Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Now, Lord, I pray that you would add to our, to our spirits this word today, this message today, that we would leave this place changed by the power 
of your Holy Spirit, and I thank you for it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen Amen. and amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. There are some that think that because we believe in monotheism, that's one God, that there's not multiple gods, there's one God. So because there are people that think that because we believe in monotheism, one God, that we cannot accept the concept of the Trinity. Well, the reality is the concept of the Trinity is wrapped up in the God. Amen? See, the Bible teaches that the Godhead consists of three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each one fully God, each one showing fully the divine nature of God. In Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22, it says, And when all the people were baptized, it it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the uh, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. Now this is probably the the most uh, prevalent passage of Scripture that speaks to the Trinity. Because here you have Jesus in the river with his cousin John the Baptist being baptized. You have the voice of God from the heavens saying, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And you have the, 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 the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descending out of heaven and landing on Jesus. So it's a very easy passage of Scripture to picture and to depict the Trinity, the triune Godhead. And there are a lot of Bible scholars that agree that that New Testament baptism was by immersion, which is the picture of death, burial, and resurrection. The Lord's baptism in water was a picture of His work of redemption. It was a picture of his work of redemption. It was through his baptism and suffering on the cross that God fulfilled all righteousness. And in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, But Jesus answered and said to him, talking about his cousin John the Baptist, because remember John the Baptist was like, Hey, I'm not the one that ought to be baptizing you. You ought to be baptizing me. But Jesus says this, But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is ful- it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. Something I never realized in this passage of Scripture, in this verse, is the us. In your natural mind, if you're like me, it says uh, that it, thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness... Wouldn't you not think of Jesus and John the Baptist? But that's not the us. We're not the us. The us is the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's the us. The us in Matthew, it doesn't mean John and Jesus. It means the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so when the Lord come up out of the water and His Father spoke from heaven and identified Himself, or identified Jesus as the beloved Son of God, and the Spirit becomes visible and, and lights upon Jesus in the form of a dove. See, Those that deny the Trinity, those that deny the triune Godhead, they struggle with this verse. They struggle with this passage. They have a difficult time explaining this event away. See, the Spirit descended and the voice from heaven proclaimed the approval of the Father for His Son. His divine Son. You are my beloved Son and I am fully pleased with you. Why do you suppose God was so pleased with Jesus? Because Jesus did what the Father said. Amen? He was obedient even to the point of death. 
So the words that were spoken by the voice from heaven echo two Old Testament passages. The first is Psalm chapter 2 and verse 7. It's a messianic psalm that describes the, the coronation of Christ as the eternal king. The rule of Christ described in the psalms will begin after his crucifixion and resurrection and will be fulfilled when he comes to set up his kingdom on earth. He's coming back. He's coming back. And, and listen... It, it's it's got to be coming quick. I, I caught a clip on on the uh, the on the internet this week, and and one of the the senators or a congressman or somebody was interviewing this this lady, and he says, "Would you define a, a woman?" And she gives some. I can't say it here. It was the most absurd answer that you'd ever heard. And then he asked her another question. He said, so then what you're saying is, do you believe that a man can get pregnant and have an abortion? And she looked him right dead square in the eyes and said, yes, sir. They are breeding, folks. They are multiplying. They are growing. And you know why? Because we're not living in the triune Godhead, um, whatever, however you We're not being who Christ called us to be as the church. That, it, may, it, it angered me when I saw that. On, and, and I was like, somebody just needs to slap her back into reality. She needs, she needs to understand and know the truth of God's Word. God was not confused, folks, when He made male and female. You don't get to choose. You were created. It's no different than if you had a potter's wheel in front of you and you're spinning that thing around and around and you've got a lump of clay, which, by the way, according to Genesis, is exactly what you and I are, a clump of dirt. And the, it's the potter that forms the clay. The clay isn't like, hey, I don't like what you did with me. Change it. Church, some way, somehow, and this is what we've been talking about on Wednesdays, and I'm not advertising for Wednesday and Sunday night. I'm just saying these are some of the things that we've been hitting on very hard on those nights because the church has got to raise up and go back to the New Testament standard that was established by the apostles and by the Holy Spirit in the, in the Gospels, in the epistles, and in the book of Revelation, the, first, uh, the second and the third chapters. We got got to become the church we got to quit coming to church and begin to be the church amen that's what God's calling us to do Isaiah 42 and verses 1 through 17 described the servant Messiah who would suffer and die and as he served God and fulfilled his mission of atoning for sin on behalf of humanity. That's us. Listen, if you don't think the devil's alive and well today, just get on there and watch some of those videos on YouTube and, and those kinds of things because it is obvious that the devil is running rampant and people are listening to what he says and they're doing what he says. We need to stand up. The the Bible says that the, the, the Lord will rise up a standard against them. I think he's looking for the standard. He's looking for some people that will get filled with the Holy Ghost and begin to live and br breathe in, and move in what God's calling us to do. Well, I, I haven't heard God speak to me. Well, then get in his word. He'll talk your ear off. This side heard that. <laughs> See, it was the voice that from the throne of heaven that described both Jesus' status as a servant who would suffer and die for the people and as the king who would reign forever. Listen, 
It's been said, and I believe it. See, the, the, the donkey in, in, in the triumphal entry, Jesus came into town on a, on a donkey. Let me tell you something. When he comes back, because a donkey is, the, is a representation of peace. When he comes back, he ain't going to be riding no donkey. He's coming on a horse. What's a horse represent? A horse represents warfare. Amen? He's coming back as a conquering king. He's coming back to take over. He's, and, and listen, it's either get right or get left. Jesus did not become the Son or the Messiah at His baptism. Jesus already had His divinity from eternity past. You know why? Because that's the way it is. The opened heaven, the dove, the voice revealed to John the Baptist and to you and I as we read this that Jesus was God's Son. He came to earth as the promised Messiah to fulfill prophecy and to bring salvation to all who believe. And if we believe and if we receive it, don't you think that there's a world out there that is going straight to hell if we don't tell them? All three persons of the Trinity are named as present and active. The doctrine of the Trinity, which was developed later in church history, teaches that God is in fact three persons, yet one in essence. God the Father speaks. God the Son is baptized. God the Holy Spirit descends on God the Son. I, I'm not presenting this for us to debate. I'm not presenting this for, for anything other than you and I to line up with. Amen? Listen, I didn't go into the military. And so I don't understand that whole, I mean, I understand it, but I, I've never had to live it at, at that degree where you are absolutely at the, at the uh, dictate of your uh, drill in, uh, instructor or your your senior officer or whatever but I've heard enough of people talk about it that I know that 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 when they tell you to do something they they're, they're not giving you an option you just go do it because if you don't there's consequence how many times has the Bible called us the army of God and yet when he says for us to go and do something we act like we have an option. And we don't. It's fun, isn't it? Is this fun? Yeah. It's fun for you. It's sure fun for me. Philip and the other disciples, after their years with Jesus, should have come to know and to recognize the one among them was God in human physical form. Jesus is in fact the, the visible, tangible image of an invisible God. Of the invisible God. He's the complete revelation of what God is like. Did I not give you these scriptures? On page four? I'm on page four, I thought. I'm not on page four. I'm on page three. Whatever. Well. Hmm. What did I leave out? Anything good? About, about halfway down the page, is that where I'm at? Oh. It's okay. Everything I've said up to this point is still true. <laughs> I just get a little wrapped up in things and start flipping pages before it's their time. John chapter 5. 
Is this where we're, are we getting closer? John chapter 5 verse 17, but Jesus answered and said, my father has been working until now and I have been working. See, God is one yet three persons and this, this one God, uh, this is one of God's incomprehensible mysteries. We don't understand it. I'll tell you another incomprehensible mystery. I don't understand how I'm still alive. I don't know why he ain't killed me a long time ago. The Father is the fountainhead of the Trinity. He is the creator. He thought the first thought and is the source of all that is, uh, has been and will be created. There are no other gods before him. He's the one true God. He thought the first thought. He's the source of all that's been created. Jesus says, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Again, John chapter 5. But Jesus answered and said, my father's been working until now, and I've been working. See, Jesus was identifying himself with his father. There could be no doubt as to his claim to be God. Read, I mean, get in the Word and begin to read and you'll find it's everywhere. In the beginning, I was with God. Is that what he said? And was God. That's what he said. There, it, there's, it's, it's, it's not for debate. Jesus doesn't leave us the option to believe in God while ignoring the Son. It doesn't work that way. The Pharisees called God their Father, but they realized Jesus was claiming to have a unique relationship with Him as the Son. And in response to Jesus' claim, the Pharisees have two choices. Number one, to believe in Him or to accuse Him of blasphemy. They chose the latter. They completely missed who he was. The Son is the logos or the expression of God. He's the only begotten of the Father and he himself is God. Further, as God incarnate, he reveals the Father to us. Look at John 14 and 9. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, show us the Father? Yeah. Philip wasn't satisfied. He wanted to see the Father. He wanted to see him. I, I want to see it. I at least, before we leave this earth, want to see the Shekinah glory of God. Amen. I want to see that. Jesus explained that to see him is to see the Father because Jesus is God in human form. Philip and the disciples, after their years with Jesus, should have come to know and recognize that the one among them was God in human physical form. Again, he is the visible, tangible image of God. You can touch him. We can see him. He, 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 he has a body. He was born just like we are born. He is the complete revelation of what God is like. Jesus answered, or Jesus' answer rather, does not contain any rebuke. He's not rebuking Philip when he says this. He's explaining to Philip, who wanted to see the Father physically, that to know Jesus is to know God. He said, look, man, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father. I, <laughs> Rick, you're probably the only one that will understand what I'm about to say because you, you knew him too, but I freaked myself out on Friday. I was getting ready to go on this big hiking trip with my grandson, and before I left the house, 
my wife calls and says, that big mirror that's behind the couch that was in our bedroom, Kayla wants that, our daughter. Can you bring it? I said, sure. So I go out and I get this mirror. I don't know how long it is. It's eight foot long probably and about that wide, cased in wood. Put it in the back of my pickup, standing on edge because I don't want it to break. And it's all encased in wood, and, and so it's pretty secure. It's pretty sturdy, pretty stable. And so I take a strap, and I strap it down crossways in my pickup so it, it can't go anywhere. No problem. I put it in, and I go, and I start loading the rest of my stuff for this hiking trip that I'm going on. And I walk by my pickup, and I'm not kidding you for a second. I walked by my pickup, and my reflection was in the mirror. And I saw my, and I stopped dead in my track. I thought it was my dad. It scared me. Uh-oh. My dad had a white beard. My dad was bald-headed. I saw myself walk by that, and it literally stopped me dead in my tracks. And I thought, hmm, that's not the only dad that's watching me. It, it's, an, it's an amazing, an amazing thing. God, as spirit, is invisible, and he always will be. Christ is the image, the visible image of the visible God. For uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And so the search for God, for truth, and for reality ends in Christ. He is the way and the truth and the life. And if you want to get, see God, you have to go through Christ. Amen. So again, God's Son is His visible expression. He not only reflects God, but as God, He reveals God to us. My dad was a strict disciplinarian. He didn't tell you twice. He told you once. And before the last word could hit the ground, if you weren't moving, he began to explain by Braille. <laughs> the laying on of hands. And he wasn't even a spiritual man. But he had laying on of hands down to an art. <laughs> I promise you. He has all the priority and the authority of the firstborn prince in the king's household. That's who Jesus is. He, is. he existed before God made anything at all. Jesus Christ was. He has all the priority, all the authority of the firstborn prince in a king's household. He came from heaven. He did not come from the dust of the earth like you and I did. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit. He is Lord of all. Paul explained in no uncertain terms that the Colossian believers had to focus on the deity of Jesus. That is the fact that Jesus Christ is God. If not, their Christian faith would fall prey to false teaching. The church in America folks, whether we want to believe it or not or agree with it or not, has fallen to false teaching by and large. And, and for whatever reason, I feel like that the Lord is calling me 
to do my part to bring at least this church back to the, the New Testament concept that God through the apostles and the Holy Spirit and Jesus established in, in, in the New Testament scriptures. And by doing so, it's, it's going to challenge you because every one of us are challenged by God's word to do our part. On Wednesday night, we've been talking about the way the church is today versus the way it, God intended for it to be. They had church every day. They broke bread every day with one another. They worshiped God every day. We're doing really good to get one day. It's true. Just You don't believe me? Look around. One Sunday we'll have 120 in here. The next Sunday, 70. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm just saying there's got to come some change in our lives. We've got to make Christ priority number one over everything. Over everything. He has all the priority and the authority of the firstborn prince in a king's household. Uh, Paul explained in no uncertain terms that the Colossian believers, you and I who've read the scripture, we have to focus on the deity of Christ and on our Christian faith would fall prey to false teachers if we don't. And to put Jesus any lower is to lose the central truth of Christianity. So the Son of God is both the agent of creation and mankind's only redeemer. The Holy Spirit, He's the third person of the Trinity. He proceeds from the Father and is worshipped and glorified together with the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is the one that has inspired the Scriptures. He's the one that empowers God's people. He's the one that convicts the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. It's the Holy Ghost that does that. It's the Holy Ghost, the, the third person in the Trinity, that will never leave you. That's what He said in His Word. Turn with me to John chapter 16 and verse 8. John chapter 16 and verse 8. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The existence of the Trinity is again a mystery that one day we may understand clearly. I have a hunch it won't be this side of the grave or the rapture. I, I, at least for me anyway. So for now we know what that the Bible teaches the, the Trinity and that Jesus revealed it and the Christian church from the beginning has confessed and safeguarded this precious truth but we're letting it slip away and so we've got to reach back out and grab another handhold in first corinthians chapter 12 verses 4 through 6 it says this there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit there are differences of ministries but the same lord and there are diversities of activities but it is the same God who works all in all we're talking about the triune Godhead let me just say this in closing that all three persons of the Godhead are working to confirm our salvation amen the, he is he is he is working to confirm our salvation. Let me put it to you this way. According to John chapter 3 and verse 16, God was not willing that any would perish, so He sent His Son. That's a profound statement. You ever watched a, 
a, a movie, of course, bad guys and good guys, and you just hope that the bad guy gets his. You just, well, I'll tell you what. You know what I'm saying? And when they don't, we're disappointed. Oh, man. You let him go. He, came, he handcuffed him. You know how much money the taxpayers are going to have to lose now? Could have all been over. I'm talking about TV shows, okay? Just in faith, it's make-believe, all right? To think that the God of the universe was not willing that any of us would perish. Listen, you've got to go back and qualify that statement. And to qualify that statement, you've got to go back and find passages of Scripture that said, while you were still His enemy, Christ died for you. Are you kidding me? My enemy? Christ died for it. Yeah. So God wasn't willing that any would perish, so he sent the Son. According to Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, it says that the Son laid down his life, a ransom for many. See, there was a price to be paid to redeem you and I. If you, if you get low on money and decide, well, I'm going to take my, my wheelbarrow to the pawn shop and, and put it in hawk and get ten dollars for it or whatever if you want to get your wheelbarrow back you got to cough up ten dollars they're not just going to give it back to you they might charge you fifteen dollars for you to have salvation it cost a price and the son laid down his life as a ransom he redeemed us according to mark chapter 10 and verse 45, so God wasn't willing, so the Son laid down His life. Where does the Holy Spirit fit into this? The Holy Spirit is the seal and the teacher and the comforter that Jesus has sent to us to live in us and through us to empower us to live for Him according to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. God has set a seal upon you and I as children of God. It's as if He branded us. The devil knows who you are. The devil knows who we are. The devil wants to do everything he can. He knows about Bob and he knows about Janice and he knows their heart for the ministry and heart for this church and many of the rest of us that the enemy is just coming after over and over and over. It's not because necessarily he's mad at you. He just hates you and wants to stop you from being effective for the Lord. Many of the rest of you are going through things. There are things that are going on in your life, and you're like, what in the world? It's the enemy trying to stop you. My advice as your pastor, do it anyway. Do it anyway. Listen, he has... He has sidelined me he has derailed me so many times that i've learned when that happens that there's probably coming the next day or that day or in the, at least in the next day or two days at the outside that there's something significant going to happen in my life and i'd better be prayed up for it and i'd better be ready to to go because when you get there the enemy is going to say who are you to say anything in this event don't you remember that? Yeah, I do remember that. But I also remember that His mercies are new every morning. I also remember that if I confess my sin, He's faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I also know, and I also remember Psalm 23, and, uh, chapter uh, 32, verse 23 and 24, where it says that the steps of a righteous man are ordered to the Lord, and though he stumble, he's not utterly cast down. Why? Because the strong arm of the Lord holds him up. And I also remember Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 who says, he who began a good work, I, I, he's still working on me. If you've ever watched me try and build anything out of wood, you'll understand sometimes things have to get, I mean, I cut a board off three times, it was still too short. S 
Some, you're a little slow, but you're worth waiting on. <laughs> Some of you are like, I don't, still don't get it. <laughs> Listen, a teaspoon of sugar helps the medicine go down, right? We got to laugh a little bit. God wasn't willing that any would perish. The son laid his life down as a ransom for you and I. And the Holy Spirit has put a seal on your life. And he is the, our teacher. And he is our comforter. And Jesus sent him to live in us and to live through us and to endue us with power from on high. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads with me.